What a wetlebe means to me is that it is up to me to get the job done and to do my best. What a wetlebe means to me is to be strong in your decision making and to have the strength and courage to do what you need to do. A kundashi ajebe uh Guys, uh, first of all, we want to thank everybody for joining us today um, here at the Navajo Cultural Arts Program. Uh, we are an organization that's part of Diné College. We have joined forces with our School of Arts, Humanities, and English to bring you our uh, virtual lecture series. Our lecture series is called Ta Wuthipe. It's Navajo Contemporary Art Lecture Series, uh, where we're going to be um, broadcasting uh, the second and fourth week of every month. We have a artist or artisans uh, scheduled to speak with us uh, who are going to be telling us a lot about the backdrops of their work and their lives as artists, how they got to the level of success that they have gotten to. Um, and the way that our cultural arts program and fine arts program looks at success is that we define it in different manners. It could be something that's uh, cultural success. It could be economic success. Uh, for many of our artists who are battling um, any type of addiction, it could be um, sobriety as, as a success through the cultural arts or their fine arts work. And today we're here uh, with two of our favorite potters. Um, we have Jared So uh, joining us as well as his father, Daryl So. Jared um, is a potter who's uh, actually doing, he's doing it double on, in ceramics. So he's an MFA major and we'll let him go ahead and, and introduce him a lot better than I can, um, as well as a producer of, of Navajo pottery. He has taught uh, in the summer here over at Diné College in Lee in 2019, uh, uh, an amazing set of courses on Navajo pottery, inspired a whole bunch of youth here to just re-pick up um, and revitalize that art form. So we have Jared on the line. We also have his dad, Daryl, on the line. Um, and Daryl is uh, currently, um, uh, well, he is originally from Tuba City. And we had Daryl jump on board uh, to help us out with another program that we have going. So if you guys are interested in um, learning the Navajo language, we have a program that's called Bed Death in the Navajo Cultural Arts Language Series. And Daryl joined us um, in that uh, series to help go over uh, processes of clay making, cultural components of, of Navajo pottery. And so we're really grateful to have both of these potters online with us today. Um, I will jump out of the screen and let you guys take it over. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yes, as um, Christine was saying, I'm pursuing a Master's of Fine Arts at UNM at the University of New Mexico, um, specifying in ceramics. Um, so that has been full of many challenges and new perspectives, especially taking this very traditional art form and translating um, that into an academic setting has been interesting, especially when it comes to um, how do you translate that to a grade and to the same different concepts of, of fine arts versus folk art um, especially with how native arts um, in North America are, are typically talked about and categorized. And that's been a little bit of a challenge. Um, but um, a little bit about myself. Um, I currently live in Albuquerque. Um, that's where University of New Mexico is located. And um, my mom is from Washington State, so I, I grew up in Washington State in Spokane. 
up there for a while. And my dad um, was also living up in North Idaho for a bit um, and used to work at North Idaho College. Um, but I'll let, I'll let him d introduce himself. Oh, yeah. It's a, um, so. Greetings to everyone in you. Um, over by Sanders, Arizona, also known as Newlands. I moved here 10 years ago from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, in the panhandle of Idaho. I'm originally from Tuba City, over by the, far, the furthest east end of Black Mesa, Blue Canyon, uh, Look up in the Abrasis Chin, Stasia Kappa, Edasha Che, Kazan Edasha Nada. I don't know the Kujin Hatazi J. Katna Lenin Kanshin, I mean, commissioner, a commissioner for Nahatazi. And uh, what I do during the day when I'm not commissioner, I mean, uh, I have some cattle uh, that I'm one of the producers for Namahu Beef, also known as Native Beef. You can find those products in uh, in the Twin Arrows. There's a steakhouse. You can have one or they're in the batches. Good food, so. But also uh, learn how to do pottery. Just just stop. From my late mother, who learned it from her mom, and then also my late father also did pottery, and he picked it up from his mother, Chanel. So, so we came come from a, a strong base of the traditional Navajo pottery. So now it's a, a pleasure and an honor to share this time with you with my son and also the Nick College. Thank you, the Nick College, for um, putting up this program. This is the whole intention is to share our culture and our values with others who are interested. Oh. Um, and yeah, so uh, I want to first share a little bit of how I was first exposed to this style of pottery. Um, growing up, I we were always surrounded in a house full of it. And naturally, it was something I was curious about. Um, I would see uncles and aunts work on pottery, and I was very curious about how to replicate it. And through school, especially the art programs in school, we'd have school art, art classes about once a week. And occasionally, maybe once a year, we would get a piece of clay. And that, those styles that I knew my family would do, um, that, those classic jars um, with that bayol, that necklace on the top, and the nadan, that corn, that apple K work, um, naturally wanted to replicate it. And that only sparked more questions. Um, and then I think it took a little bit of a while for uh, my dad and my aunties to realize how serious I was about it because it takes a lot of work. It's not something that you can just pick up in an afternoon and, and, and make something. Um, usually with, with collecting clay, um, grinding your clay, screening your clay, collecting your tempers, um, which tempers are for um, adding stability to your clay. Um, when you're building something with clay, there's a shrink rate when it dries. Um, when things shrink and things shrink unevenly, um, things can tend to warp or sometimes crack. And so that temper helps to add stability in that and lessen that shrink rate. Um, further down in the process, that temper also allows those pots to withstand the heat temper the, the temperature changes within um, when you're pit firing pots so they don't crack or they don't bust. Um, and so just collecting those materials and prepping those materials can be a multiple week process. Um, and then once it comes to building it, there's um, the techniques that have to be practiced, the muscle memory that has to take practice and that to, to, to get to a point to build a vessel that will fire and, and won't crack um, takes a lot of discipline and takes a lot of time. And so I think they, they didn't quite um, um, 
once I started showing effort and work into experimenting with clay on my own, then they, and I was able to ask very specific questions, then that opened up a lot of doors. Um, uh, opened up a lot of doors when it came to um, conversations with my family, exchange of knowledge, um, a more willingness to um, share because they knew I was serious. Um, and uh, so, so that's that first journey of how I first got into pottery is kind of where I got a couple years from before now, I was on, on my undergrad. I was doing a, my undergraduate degree in electrical engineering and I used pottery as a, as a coping me mechanism for stress in school, as an escape, as an outlet. Uh, I jokingly say I use it to procrastinate quite a bit um, <laughs> from my other studies, but it ended up really blessing my life in other ways because I started to show um, in the art markets and um, the Southwest art market circuit, as well as showcasing my work online. And so then that's when I realized that um, there was more curiosity just from, not just from my family, that they were proud that I was, I was picking this up and, and carrying on this legacy that came from, from my, my parents, uh, my, my aunts and uncles and my grandparents and their parents, um, that there was a community question of pot, used for ceremony, used for function, um, used for specific things. And so then that made me realize the, the community need for it, um, which was uh, very validating. It was a way of affirmation for my, all that work that I put in. It wasn't just something of a hobby, but it was something that it's more of a way of life. Um, the, there's a there's a rhythm to making pottery whether you're collecting these pots um, or collecting these materials prepping these materials moving these pots you have more than one thing going on because there's that time element of having to wait for pots to to dry in between things and so it was nice to see that there was a community support as a community need and realizing that I had a knowledge to and and a, a skill to to fit that need, and um, that was really really validating. Um, and so then that's when people started to ask me for for drum pots for anaje, um, the enemy way ceremonies of the summer, um, asking for boiling pots or serving bowls. Um, and so then I realized. Um, that for for Navajo there aren't a lot of potters compared to other pueblos or other tribes of the southwest where pueblos are really well known for pottery and um, to f meet that community demand we needed more potters and so this last summer it was really great to work with the Navajo cultural arts program at the Net College to teach to kind of revitalize a course of um, teaching that style of pottery to to um, have more people making pots so you can not only fill that community demand of, of these, these functional communal pots, but as well as to allow room for creativity, inspiration, that, that clay and that student and that potter takes, takes that, that pottery, that, that, that style to the next step and incorporating um, new forms, a new level of um, execution and technique and, and, and it's more of an artistic approach at that point. Mm -hmm. Well, Jared, um, he's actually started his interest when he was really young. He still had diapers on when we uh, visit my late mother one day, um, she was firing pottery and she just had to mix some clay. And he picked up the stick and he started poking the ash pit. And after that, while we're inside, while we're visiting, uh, my mother noticed that uh, Jared had um, got a piece of clay in his mouth and had clay all over his mouth. 
And that's when my mother said, well, there it is. If you got a taste of it, it's going to become a potter. So that planted that seed in him. And um, it took a while for it to grow. I think today what we're doing, that's what we're doing, is we're giving you seed to this knowledge about pottery making. And it's up to you what you're going to do with the seed. You can dispose of it, you can throw it away, you can eat it, you can take care of it, and watch it grow. And then as it grows, it's going to become part of you. And that's who you are as a tene. And the pottery has a, some traditional stories. One of the things it does is earlier, Jared mentioned you have to be disciplined. <laughs> ボンスとこそエディスタ。ペンインディンショポンチョスア。ハディシダツアンチドケストンダツアヤジキョイ。ドホワチンデンデ。オイハツアマティスデ。コシマアコジュミシンデ。ショヘジョチンダ。ジョ
once I started to observe how the art market views our pottery as well as how do I talk about it in school, I had a whole nother challenge because it brought up the question of authenticity. And typically what, what um, non-natives, non-Navajos um, deem as authentic and where that is rooted. And it became first a struggle on how to you, you, you can see it, but it's how do you articulate it and understand it. Um, from our perspective, um, from a Navajo perspective, from a Diné perspective, it's rooted in culture. It's rooted in community. Um, but when I realized going to school, a lot of the things that deemed my work as authentic um, was by an outside audience was partially racialized. It was following old concepts from anthropology, um, archaeology, um, where historically our artwork was more classified as artifact rather than fine art, which was used as a tool to legitimize um, European aesthetics of art as fine art and to create a tier system. Um, of of what was what was legitimate fine art and what wasn't, and so then I realized because of that, um, in terms of the literature that takes place in school or how people things how things are talked about, it inherently limited me as an artist for my creativity. Um, authenticity was seen as in in um, as traditional techniques which had a time element um, that is contextualized of something that's in the past um, to recreate the past over and over again rather than being in the present um, the beautiful thing that i see with how we view our own work in a communal sense is it's always very present um, it's always very alive it's not something that exists completely in the past but it, there's a continuous line to here to where we're at now and uh, that gives us a little bit of perspective of, of the direction of where that continuity will exist in the future well when it came to um, sometimes the show art show definitions and qualifications it was rooted in this idea of authenticity from anthropology and archaeology um, of using traditional techniques of recreating old forms um, and firing in old specific ways, which has been a challenge for me as when I go to an, this MFA program, um, specializing in fine arts, it begs the question whether or not to use a kiln, of where or not to use commercial clay, where other artists around the world don't necessarily always have to navigate those specific details of where they're sourcing their material um, and so because of that it's it's been a little tricky on how to articulate that um, because for me as well as for my students I do not do not want to limit their creativity um, what type of materials they should be be using um, techniques they should be using because we're very contemporary people we're existing now um, and so it brings up the question of, of what the futurity of this, this practice should be um, and, and what the futurity of pottery and, and potters look like um, in a commu community sense, because it's always been rooted and defined in community. Um, and so I think it's really important to um, what, how to, to acknowledge the power that this, this style has in grounding yourself um, in community and continuing to make traditional forms, traditional clays, so that you can use those forms, um, those locations, use that seed that was planted as a point of reference for the direction that you go so that you don't stray too much. Um, as, a, as, I, as I've noticed in kind of the art world, there's a big thing with ego. Um, selling yourself as an artist personality 
selling yourself as a name and how it's really easy to get swept away with, with ego and, and go on a narrative that might not be completely true to yourself or where you're from or your community. And so it's really important to um, know where you come from, uh, know who you are, know who your family is. Um, and those styles and those artistic um, aesthetics that are associated with that, that you continue to practice that. Um, because when you practice that and you recreate that, you recreate that, fam that, that family memory. Um, and that has, that memory has a lot of power, um, has a lot of um, knowledge associated with it. And so when we pick up those materials, those family materials, um, those, that carries that family, that family memory, where when we act in the process of that, we're, 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 we're accessing that and we're, we're pushing it forward. So Either any it has a story, it has an origin story. A lot of uh, archaeologists, anthropologists will say we picked it up from some other group of people. That's the stir opinion, that's not true. When we go back to our culture, we know that before us, the animal people came forth and that we picked up a lot of their knowledge, we picked their language. It's for us, the five finger people, that knowledge. So the pottery came from the Dunbeetle. When Dunbeetle chant is Masab Tsado, a Adon Bidya. So this is the process. You can't put a timeline on it. So we're still a part of that process. That's who we are as the Nini Trini, Nede Isnangkizya, Dhyim 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 It was given to us by the Holy People. That's what makes it unique and different. And culture, we talked about culture. You have to have three components. You have to understand your land. You have to have a relationship through pottery making. You get to know your structure of your layout of your landscape, the mesas, the formations, and you know where the clays are at. That's one way you have that connection to your land. Number two is you have to have your language. Learn your language. Keep making that mistake. People will laugh at you, but that's learning. That's part of learning. Adam and Kod, our way of life. Not a religion or not a belief. And Kod is what gives us that life, that connection. That's our part. That's our culture. And then in Guinea, we have that. We can't lose any of that. So these type of information, these type of knowledge makes us who we are as a Dene. And we'll continue to learn and pick up these different knowledge throughout our lifespan. Now, once you start developing clay and you become very good at it, it's unlimited where it's going to take you. It's going to take you to some beautiful places. You're going to meet some beautiful people. And you may end up at a huge art show and make a living. That's what my parents used to say, and it's true. One of these days, they're going to use resources from that. And they're, it's going to feed you. It's going to clothe you. It's going to put shelter over you. Now, yeah, the pottery world, it's different. I grew up when my mother was just selling to the training post. Bill Beaver training post over at King's Canyon and a couple other places. You know those trading post owners, what they do about our potteries? 
they lowball us in prices. They devalue it. Even our rugs or silversmith, they look at it. Once you leave, buy or sell your stuff to them, they jack up double the price. Until you get better and better at it, you, you bypass them, hit the big shelf. Or Bill Beaver paid $60 for a jar of pottery from you. Now in Sanity, you can sell it for $400. A huge difference. And that's the thing about being the pottery. We have to value what, what we make. We have to value our knowledge. We have to value who we are, where we came from, and where we're going. This is a part of the process that we're starting. We're only part of that process, and we're going to continue that. That line that Jared made reference to. Now, you're being able to articulate to it. That's what you're going to develop. As you start making your pottery, you're going to start talking about certain type of clay, colors, what are the ingredients, how you shape it and form it, how much water you add to it. What's your favorite type of pottery you'll make? Soon you'll be able to talk about it. You see that growth, that development. It's going to make you think about the, uh, the texture, the thickness, and the form. And how well you handle it. These are all different techniques you're going to be developing. So, there we go. How about that one? Yeah. Now it's <laughs> I think that you guys bring up some really great um, points about, uh, you know, the different types of obstacles you're going to face as, as a potter maker, as a pottery maker in the 21st century, depending upon what your end game is, right? What, what's your ultimate goal? Where do you want to sell at? What do you want to do? Um, and so I guess some of the questions that that we have posed for you um, is is how does your art immediately serve your community, right? Where do you see yourselves fitting in in, in that that arena? Um, I I've been thinking about this a lot, um, especially when it comes to not only like the physical pots but the knowledge to make those pots. Um, I've been very I've been. A, made an effort to be very transparent about the process to do it, um, to empower community members to um, make their own work, um, whether it's uh, for tobacco pipes, um, for, um, for drum pots, um, for all those, those different things to that, that they can carry that knowledge and, and um, manifest that to, to bless their family. Um, to, to bring prayers to their family um, um, and not only um, with with pottery for I, I kind of have an unwritten rule where if this if I have pottery that somebody wants to buy it and they're going to use it for traditional use and they're going to use it for a ceremony then I have a price for that because I want to make sure that my pottery lives that kind of life beyond me. Um, being very um, thoughtful about intention for what this pot will be used for in terms of the physical form and those things and how that will translate to benefiting community. He's, uh, and he did after you make it, after you fire it, yape na the chunky. Once you fire that thing, it creates its own image, its own identity, or its own purpose. Adonda, not offset. Clay pipe. A that the net ends, and there's three different types. There's one like a cone, and you have to hold it and look up. 
And they who, who in such case as don't your whole purpose is to straighten your thought, your purpose and your plan straight on what you're supposed to be going after in life. Think about things straight and make those planning your prayers and your song will be straight. So those clay, clay pipes are designed that way. And then you have a clay pipe that has a, a point at the bottom. So there's a group of you smoking. You have that little uh, bottom part that is extended to hold when it gets hot. So, so, so several of you can continue and finish the tobacco that's in there. So to me, is that's giving back to our people. I've seen a lot of people coming back and they pick it up and you give them tobacco. And there's all different kinds of tobaccos too. They say, oh, I can't sleep at night. Oh, that's what this is for. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going after a job. I'm going after my home. I want to feel a home. I want something that's good for my home and my children. And they say, no, yeah, not cool. that's what this is for. I want to relearn a song. I want to learn my prayers to grow. And those are, you can have prayers for that. Another person will say, my child's mind is disturbed. It's unbalanced. He's wandering off. They're wandering off. They're engaging in things they shouldn't be. I want them to have that smoke. I want my child to be able to balance their mind again and get refocused and reconnect with who they are. That's how our community benefits. Or like right now, during this, uh, this outbreak, we can use our bowls and, and put our medicine in there, boiling, and the sap within that will mix it and you'll drink it, and it builds your immune system. Once they drink that and they realize, I want to know what these plants are. What kind of different plants do we use? Is there a I don't know once they start learning about the plant, there's the offerings with your prayers. They learn, they'll learn how to make offerings. They know how to make those prayers themselves and they can collect herbal medicine for themselves and they can use those potteries for these purposes. And again, it all goes back to reconnecting with that process, that process that our forefathers and the end and the end, the holy people put here for us. Oh, just ah, oh, just ah, oh, just ah, you're putting it inside, you're learning about it, and you're nurturing that seed and it's starting to grow. Um, you know, I think you guys um, have some really great um, ideas in terms of how this, the, what you guys do as a contemporary art, regardless of you, whether you classify it as cultural and fine arts, that, that has immediate impact on, on the community. And so I guess, where do you see, you know, you talk a lot about your family being the inspiration, um, that calling even of eating clay as, as the, that inspiration from your work. But where do you see your work going in the future? Um, I, in terms of creative design, um, do you can, do you see yourself pushing boundaries in terms of materials, in terms of techniques? Um, I guess this would probably speak a little bit more to Jared, considering you're in that MFA ceramics program, mm -hmm. which definitely pushes a different style and a different different area. But obviously, Daryl's more than welcome to talk to talk toward that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so this has been on my mind often. Um, the biggest thing that I've been thinking about with the future of my own work um, is making sure I collaborate often um, with other artists or other people of different exp expertise. Um, 
And in the art world, um, there is a very specific, um, I guess, genre of art of, of landscape representation, most iconically known in photography or, or um, painting. Um, but one thing that I've been thinking about or a concept that has, has been talked about often is how food can be a way of landscape representation. Uh, specific foods can um, grow in different climates and different landscapes and is a representation not only of the landscape but the, the community and the culture that exists in that landscape and how there's unique foods that come out of that and unique dishes. And inherently, pottery is this a similar concept that it too can be a form of landscape representation in terms of the materials you use, um, the colors of nature that exist in that nature, that, that, that landscape to, that brings out this pot and these colors and how a union between food and pottery has been a life or like, it's been that for time and memorial for as long as we, we've known. And so I think about, um, using food or using pottery uh, to um, complement culinary um, efforts. Um, I know there's a lot of um, very gifted Navajo chefs um, that are pushing the boundaries on, on cuisine and how food or, or vessels to, to display that and to serve that um, can be a powerful form of landscape representation. And furthermore, um, having when when um art art is often shown in galleries um there's often different ways to, to showcase this work whether it's a pedestal um there's i've i've thought about using vessels as long alongside other things to um, create an installation piece um used for storytelling um whether it's storytelling of who I am as a way of introducing myself or of telling stories of our origin um, and trying to also consider when is appropriate to have that show in the context of what time of what what a uh, time of year it is um, so that it is still respectful and appropriate. I also think about um, making at least lately, um, pieces that aesthetically and design that will be beautiful in my home that I can use that are still uh, very artistic in a way. Um, I um, late, like recently I've been wanting to make more teacups um, and tea vessels, um, so I started making this this kettle that can go right on the stove because the materials and the clay can tuck the heat well. So you treat it just like a cast iron. And so this also brings when you um, engineering questions of um, using multimedia um, with wood as well as other binding materials uh, to um, introduce more functional qualities that you could see it in your home um, down to soap dishes to, to serving plates. And not to mention the expanse of uh, uh, sculptural forms of, of whether that be uh, um, important animals um, that have large significance and in, in, in stories and prayers or or other other deities. We have one of your animals here. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you can see it over here. I'm grab it quick. Um, these are one of the the pieces that you made um, during the summertime with uh, yeah. with our summer class. Um, this guy's got a little story behind him. I don't know if you want to go into it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, that was the firing where we had a lot of breakage in the firing, um, and it was a very uh, catastrophic thing to view. Um, not just as the instructor, but with all the students of. Uh, uh, realizing how many factors go into pottery and how many things can go wrong um, where you really have to be thoughtful about it and you really have to think it through and so with that firing we lost a large majority of everything that went in there 
and that guy, that that ram, uh, lost a horn, and uh, I remember uncovering it from that fire. <laughs> it was it was it was a sad day, um, yeah. but I think it brings a lot. Um, I was fortunate enough to to join Jared in in that class, and um, it was it was a humbling experience. I think for everybody. Yeah. But the most important part about that, because the first fire we we did was went phenomenally, right? I think yeah, one, one yeah. Piece break and then the second firing, the element it just wasn't the right time, and we were forcing it. And I think Daryl spoke a lot about that, right? That you can't push it. Pottery seems to uh, bring out the patience and and in in each of us. But the the most exciting part about that for me was that the students didn't quit. Um, yeah. Students were like, "All right, we're going back at this." So after that class, you know, you saw a resiliency that really grew from these students. We had really young students to, you know, older, older students who were like, all right, let's, let's do this. We're going to work at home and then we're going to come back together and we're going to refire and, and it's going to happen. We're going to make it happen. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to give it a shot. And so yeah. that was the, for me, the, I don't know, we have to come up with a good name for that guy, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah. that's what I remember. I remember yeah, that. No, no, uh, my late mother was really strict about that when she was working on pottery. And I remember one afternoon she was working on it and my late father came back from a, a local community meeting and he came in all uh, worked up and, and he was really uh, agitated from the meeting. And I remember my mother just stopped and covered her pottery and told my dad to settle down because she's working on a pottery and had to ask my father to go up to the sheep camp, check on the sheep and settle down. And uh, sometimes you're not aware of what people are going through as you're working on a group. Some of them maybe just came from a very tense place and they still harbor that feeling when they come in when you're trying to work on your pottery. That has a lot uh, 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 to reflect on how we do our pottery. You have to have reverence for it. You have to respect it because of the nature of it, the elements that is utilized. That comes back to us too, as a person, that we have to have reverence for ourselves. We have to have um, respect, self-control, that discipline. There's one area too that my mother was very strict about the ladies worked on, the young girls that came to the house and worked on it. She always asked them and says, how are you doing? Sati, Sati, meaning if it's that time of the month, she would tell them, you need to go home. You need to stay at home, stay put and take care of yourself. Once you're done, then you can come back and we'll pick up on it again. She understood that. And that's something that she taught. And I always remembered that. She always emphasized that to the young young ladies that were coming to work on potteries. Even those things they tended to. Because uh, when the person's probably going through that, their emotions at a whole completely different level. So these are the things that people are told to attend to. And it's all part of our culture. Ceremonies, you know, they're told not to go. Even when they're at home, they keep themselves away from their partners and from everybody else. We no longer practice those or teach those. People take offense now. So we have to have that understanding, the uniqueness. But the pottery, I always come back to the, state, uh, to the basic traditional form. Ultimately, I explore with it, but I'm very cautious with it. My late Nelly, my late father's mother, she once shared with us, she goes, the Anasazi people, they make pottery and they design them. They design them, paint them all different ways. Yodaj Chan. He said they over-decorated, they over-created it. And through that creation, they opened the door for those elements that were harmful to them. Ibn-na, because of that reason, esteem. Ibn-na, they're not here with us anymore. So you have to respect this pottery. 
You just can't go and create whatever you want. You have to stay within the teachings, the purpose, and the functionality of it. And uh, I think a lot of artists that are out there, especially um, when they're not really connected with their culture, they can uh, go places they shouldn't be going. That's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, Nanana, Jer. Yeah, no. Um, it makes me really think about the students from the summer, um, of how proud I am of them. Um, especially the forms that they're drawn to making. Um, the styles, they, they all have their unique style, but there's a commonality to it all. Um, and what their intent is for what they're making it. Um, and further, further with that, um, with respecting that pottery and having that reverency, I've been really impressed with their own discipline with it and their own persistence to do it because it'll humble you really quick. Um, things, will, there's breakage and there's warping and all these things that go wrong, especially while you're, while you're learning how to interact with the, these materials. Um, it's, been, it's been really awesome to see. Um, and really, really awesome to see to, to to go back to where they're from and collect clay from and materials from their their family sites, and then and then continue on to not not let this that breakage from that um, that really catastrophic firing uh, hold them back or discourage them. I think that really um, gives us a, a great segue to the last question that we have for you guys today. Um, and what piece of advice would you give to Navajo, young Navajo artists? I mean, they don't have to be age, age wise, but um, people who are just starting out um, specifically and with ceramics or pottery, what kind of advice would you give to young Navajo potters out there? Um, your thoughts are powerful. Your words are powerful. What you bring into the world, is, it carries a lot of weight. And so be really mindful of that because what you think and what you say will manifest itself into the world. You're able to do that. You're able to create that. And so really make that decision in your head to do that. If you want to be a potter, if you want to be a silversmith, if you want to be a weaver, a painter, think positively about those things be self-disciplined about those things and make it happen um, and realize that when you're when you're working on those things your thoughts matter if you're stressed if you're you'll get frustrated with the material like find a way to ground yourself find a way to step away and, and ground yourself and and with that if you couple that with a, an idea of making a continual effort every day to improve in something whether it's your pottery or something else but every day if, if pottery is a goal make sure every day you do something toward it whether it could be no no matter how big or, or how small you you make that constant effort to, yeah, to know um, that relationship. Yeah. my my late mom one day told me he goes consciously or unconsciously what you receive receptively or or radiate or what you cultivate is what you're gonna influence the world with. Meaning that so it's always coming back to yourself become self-aware know who you are know your clans become self-aware with that Self reverence. Adoha that's where it all starts. 
And that's where you can have the ability to make and pursue whatever you want, and you'll do well, and especially with pottery. Thank you guys so much for, for joining us today. We really appreciate your, your time, your work, all the dedication that you give towards the future generation of potters. Uh, we wanted to let everybody know um, that uh, we're looking for feedback. So if you guys have a moment, we have a link below um, in this particular uh, live stream feed. If you could go ahead and fill out that survey and provide us with some feedback. We are a grant funded uh, program um, here at Denai College. And so every, every kind of feedback that we can get back always helps us out um, and we have some cool incentives. I think that they're cool anyway. Um, we are going to be doing a draft, a raffle drawing next uh, week next Tuesday. Um, so next Tuesday at three o'clock, Crystal, um, our NCAP coordinator and I will be doing uh, a raffle and we'll be drawing some prizes uh, for some NCAP gear. We have a raffle for an NCAP hat um, that we have for our program, as well as a pot made by Jared uh, that we're going to be also putting up for raffles. So if you guys can go ahead and do those surveys, we would truly appreciate it. Other than that, uh, we'll be coming back in two weeks uh, with Lyndon Sosi, who's a master silversmith, and he'll be joining us for this segment, A Tall with a Fit. We hope that you guys are staying hey, healthy, staying home, staying safe, um, and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Nee, <laughs> <laughs>